From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And coming up today, two more speakers from that 2017 Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle Workshop hosted by K-State this week. Out of the University of Calgary, John Kostelik will talk about management of beef bulls to promote fertility. He'll look at the nutritional game plan that has resulted in more fertile bulls. And he'll discuss what to consider in evaluating young bulls for breeding soundness. Then K-State's Bob Weber will share what he considers the highlight information from this workshop. Bob made a presentation in yesterday's session on guidelines for selection of replacement heifers. And on this week's K-State Horticulture segment, Raymond Cloyd has an update on lawn and garden insect activity. Here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever wondered why livestock producers burn Kansas pasture? Here's the deal. Controlled burning helps preserve the prey and allows every bite feeder cattle eat to be the most nutritious. National Wildlife and Parks also feel it is a necessity to help with wildlife populations. So the next time you see a Kansas pasture burning, know it's for the good of our wildlife, our prairie, and our livestock. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you listening in on this Thursday. We've still more for you now from that special workshop hosted by K-State Research and Extension this week in Manhattan, where expertise from all around this nation and beyond gathered to be part of the Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle Workshop. A tremendous lineup of topics and speakers. One of those is with us now. He's out of the University of Calgary, obviously from Canada, a veterinarian there, John Kostelik. And John was invited to come to this conference and talk about predicting and promoting fertility in beef bulls. John, welcome first of all to K-State. It's good to have you here. Great, thank you very much. It's my first time here in Manhattan having a fantastic time and uh, certainly look forward to returning here in the future. From the producer's vantage point, it's important for them to have some understanding of bull fertility and signs and signals of the level of that fertility, is it not? Yes, absolutely. The bull, from a genetic perspective, the the bull contributes uh, approximately 80% of the genetics in the herd. The genetics of any individual bull are much more important than any individual cow. We often say that the ultimate test of fertility is to turn a a bull out with a group of cows. We also are very quick to add that we usually don't do that because it's very expensive. And yet if we do not do any sort of evaluation of the bull's breeding potential prior to the breeding season, in essence we are doing a fertility test with the bull. If the bull works well and we get lots of calves, that's a really good thing. If the bull fails to work well, and that's not rare, it can be a very expensive way for us to find out that we had a bull that that really wasn't performing up to expectations. Before we venture into evaluation, you talked a bit in your presentation about the effects of bull nutrition and particularly during calfhood, setting the stage for that bull's performance. Share a few thoughts on that, if you will. Absolutely. There's some old data that indicated that age of of a bull's dam had an effect on scrotal circumference and ultimately that was related to milk production so that we know that a bull that has a a two-year-old heifer as a mother is going to have smaller scrotal circumference. There was some work done on bull nutrition in dairy bulls back in the 1950s at Cornell, but really not much had been done until a few years ago when we we looked at this and realized this is an amazing opportunity for research and, and input. We know that early in the life of a bull, there's a lot of hormonal changes that are happening, and there's some really important changes between approximately 10 weeks and 25 weeks of age. And we determined that if we feed bulls really well during that interval, more or less from birth up to around 25 weeks, if we fed them really well, and we looked at both energy and protein together, versus if we held them back, the bulls that were fed well, and we gave them about 30% more than expected requirements of energy and protein, they reached puberty about a month earlier, but more importantly, they had scrotal circumference 20 to 30% bigger, produced 20 to 30% more sperm, and furthermore, that sperm was normal in terms of its fertility when we did in vitro fertilization. So simply by feeding bulls better from 
more or less birth through to about 25 weeks, we could hasten puberty, make larger testes, more sperm, so that that bull could cover more cows versus if we held them back. The other question we asked, gee, if they're held back prior to 25 weeks, can we overcome that? Is there a way to, to supplement them afterwards? In other words, bulls that were held back before 25 weeks and then we fed them that 130% to try to recover or to overcome those earlier deficits, it simply didn't work. Most of the work on nutrition in bulls was done a number of years ago. Uh, and in beef bulls, really focusing on diet after weaning. The very short answer to a lot of work there is if you overfeed bulls, especially excessive energy after weaning, you will get excessively fat bulls. You'll have laminitis or so-called founder, abscesses in the liver, damage to the to the rumen, uh, often vesiculitis or infection of the internal reproductive organs on the bull. So overfeeding bulls after weaning is really harmful based on our data done initially in beef bulls and more recently in dairy bulls, very clearly indicates if we feed them well before 25 weeks, we can allow that bull to really express his genetic potential for testicular development and and to get large testes, earlier puberty. So on a practical basis, to implement this uh, at the farm level, we really encourage people to consider creep feeding their their bull, their bull calves that are potential sires uh, with the cautionary note that it should be a combination of both energy and protein, not just energy by itself, and of course vitamins and minerals. And I'd, I'd probably be a bit cautious about feeding the female calves because that's probably not in your best interest to be doing that to promote their fertility, but on the male side it works really well. What about physical soundness of the bull and evaluating that? What are the essentials there in your view, John? That's a great question. So we would like the bulls to be fed really well through to weaning. And then once you wean the bulls, you can actually go through and measure scrotal circumference. And bulls that have very small testes at weaning can be quite confidently culled because they have a very high probability of of small testes at at a year of age. In addition, at weaning, you can uh, look over the bulls, for example, that have only a one descended testis, a so-called cryptorchid. Bulls that have bad conformation, for for example... uh, very poor legs, poor feet, uh, other conformational issues. Those bulls could be destined uh, to go into a feeding program, and then you can put the time and the resources on the bulls that, that you feel have reasonable potential as, as future breeding animals. A fair part of this evaluation has to do with the expected use of that bull, though, does it not? Just exactly how one intends to employ that bull as their sire power. Absolutely. In terms of a breeding soundness evaluation, we go through, we look at the bull, we make sure he's healthy, he doesn't have any genetic abnormalities, doesn't have any structural problems with his feet and legs, his teeth and eyes and everything are normal. And then we focus on the reproductive system. We look at the at scrotal circumference, which is really a measure of the size of the testes. We collect sperm and evaluate those sperm. We look at motility and morphology. We have minimum standards for scrotal circumference. For motility, is usually minimum 30%, rarely limiting. Morphology, minimum 70% normal, maximum 20% head defects. Really, our goal there is to eliminate the bottom end bulls. We we sometimes say with uh, uh, with a bit of a smile, we want to identify the studs and eliminate the duds. So really, the breeding soundness is to identify bulls expected to have below acceptable levels of fertility, it's relatively much more difficult to say, well, this bull is, is, you know, 10% or a little bit better than that bull. That being said, there is a some flexibility in there if we're looking for a bull that, for example, has a moderate birth weight, has moderate head and shoulders, looks like he would be good on heifers. We've got a small group of heifers. We've got 15 heifer, yearling heifers or something that we want to breed. We expect those calves to go into a feeding program. We just want to calve those heifers out and then subsequently breed them to bulls, maybe to produce um, future uh, breeding stock or whatever. The bull that would be acceptable for that might just meet, you know, might meet the minimum standards. Whereas if we're really looking, we're a seed stock producer and we're looking for really making genetic gains, then we want to be identifying bulls that are well above the minimum requirements, for example, for scrotal circumference and has lots of other attributes about the bull in terms of his background, in terms of his uh, phenotype, and those are the bulls that we then would say, we think this bull really has a future in our breeding program, it's going to help really move our, our program ahead and provide great genetics for other folks. So I think we need to decide 
what will be the use of that bull? Is it is it a modest breeding pressure to just, we say, a heifer freshener just to get some calves on the ground? I think that's one set of expectations if we're looking for an animal that's going to be a long-term part of our breeding program and really move the breed ahead and have some great genetics that'll help other folks in the industry. That's a different set of expectations. One further talking point from your presentation, although you had so much more to share at the conference, what about genetics and genomics as selection criteria? Where do they fit into the modern-day picture here? There's no question that genetics and genomics are the way of the future. We are learning more and more all the time. The reality is that the beef industry is somewhat behind the dairy industry on that side. Dairy has much better record-keeping they have more genetic tools that are, that are available. You've got a very long history of genetic evaluation, good records, uh, usually uh, lots of animals that are available for uh, the phenotypic records. On the beef side, of course, we have multiple breeds. In general, we have far less data and information than we do on the dairy side. So we are somewhat behind, but there's an amazing future opportunity the key is that we got to have good, reliable information to make good evidence-based decisions. And at this point, I think we are still not nearly as far down the road as we'd like to be. But in my mind, there's no doubt that genetic and genomic evaluations have a really important role. And in the meantime, there's still a lot to be said about good record keeping and good evaluation uh, of your animals and, and ultimately good management and husbandry so that animals can, uh, can be healthy and well and achieve to their genetic potential. John, we do appreciate you not only coming to the workshop and sharing your expertise, but visiting with us right here on the broadcast today as well. Well, it's really been fun, and I must say that the the folks here have been incredibly hospital, made me feel real welcome, and I, I really do appreciate that. And uh, although this is my first visit, I, I sure hope it's, that it's not my last, and I look forward to another time here. Thank you. And we would welcome you back. Thank you very much. He is a veterinarian with the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada, of course. John Kostelik, and he presented a session on predicting and promoting fertility in beef bulls at the Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle Workshop, hosted by K-State this week. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. As you know, we have visited the last two days with a couple of the numerous featured speakers at the 2017 Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle Workshop hosted by Kansas State University, and it's just astounding the information that was conveyed at this workshop. We wanted to get some thoughts from our guest now about the takeaways that he's drawn from this workshop and interacting with his peers and producers as well. Bob Weber, as you know, is a cow-calf specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Bob, we haven't talked about this up to the moment, but the scope of the expertise at this workshop is is overwhelming, quite frankly. Right, Eric, and, and thanks for having me on today. The uh, Applied Repro Strategies and Beef Cattle uh, meeting here in, in Manhattan really has been a, a pretty uh, astounding gathering of thought leaders from both the uh, sort of reproductive physiology in, in beef cattle community, but also uh, you know academics and uh, uh, trade folks that uh, have come, as well as producers that are really engaged in you know, using artificial insemination, embryo transfer technologies, as well as, you know, ultrasound and some other uh, applications to um, really advance the, the science and application of, of reproductive physiology in beef. 
This was intended to be a broad brush look at repro techniques, technologies, strategies, and so forth, right? Right. So the, the, the meetings, uh, and hats off to my colleague Sandy Johnson for putting together just really an outstanding program here in, in Manhattan, covered everything from um, you know the fundamentals. So for those of you in the listening audience that have, have uh, were tempted to come to the meeting and didn't, uh, next time it's nearby, please come. It provides uh, just a really uh, essential foundational understanding of particularly on, on the cow side, uh, estrus cycle and, and some of the basics in terms of uh, endocrinology that uh, mediates that system um, and drives reproductive efficiency in beef cows. Um, the great thing about this meeting is it's really producer focused. Um, and so lots of uh, presentations here from producers. Um, so some, some local talent, as I call them, Barb Downey from Downey Ranch here at Wamigo uh, and Galen Fink both presented and, and conveyed their applications and successes and challenges with the technology. And those really provide, I think, a really um, set of tangible lessons for us, not only as academics, but certainly as producers, um, and make us think about how we can apply the technology. There's a little ground truthing there, as a matter of fact, as you interacted with producers. By the way, it's worth noting that nearly 400 people filling the seats at this workshop, there was hardly a vacant seat in the room. What you took away from this, from everything here, what jumped out to you as an enlightening aspect of beef reproduction that was covered at this? Yeah, so one, one of the things, uh, Eric, that, that stood out to me, um, and, and actually a couple of speakers made this point as well, is that reproduction is, is a systems function. It's the culmination of lots of things going right. Um, and sometimes I think as producers, we think there, there's, you know, surely some silver bullet out there. And, and the reality is there's not. And making sure our um, bulls and cows get everything done we need them to, it's, it really is a systems approach. So, uh, and the conference took that approach in terms of, of programming and presentations, ranging from, you know, the basics of physiology, um, but also a number of the animal health challenges we face. Uh, Greg Hanselcheck from here at K-State did a great job talking about some emerging diseases uh, that are of importance to us in beef cattle production. Uh, a number of other veterinarians talked about different animal health strategies to help maintain and promote reproductive efficiency you know, nutritional targets, uh, nutritional effects on, on repro are substantial, as everybody knows. Um, those were, were highlighted and, and some opportunities illustrated. So the systems approach was one that I thought was really, really important uh, for us to take away. Did you hear any cutting edge technology discussions within this workshop? Anything that's the next greatest thing, so to speak, that you came across? Yeah, so one of the, the things that I think is is coming about, two things really. One of them is the opportunities we have before us, both in, in seed stock and commercial production, to use gender-sorted semen. So um, bull semen that's been uh, manipulated to produce either predominantly bull calves or heifer calves provides uh, some really interesting opportunities for us in both seed stock and commercial production. In the commercial side in particular, um, maybe some, some really tactical approaches to replacement female production. You know, the, the other bits are, are really, you know, how do we use uh, some of the uh, genetics technologies uh, in, in some cases, um, some horizons uh, for us. Uh, Dr. Andy Prather from over at uh, the University of Missouri um, spoke about some of the new genome editing technologies that are uh, coming and been applied uh, extensively in, in, in swine research programs that's starting to make its way in, into the beef cattle circles. Undoubtedly some challenges uh, in a regulatory environment associated with that, uh, but some really tremendous potential for us to um, really precisely manipulate the genetic merit of, of animals in our production system. While you're on that track, your colleague here at K-State, Megan Rolf, spoke to the outlook for genomics as part of genetic selection, and, and that's certainly part of the equation. Right. So uh, I'm a geneticist sort of by, by training and, and uh, a cow-calf specialist by uh, avocation, really. But my, my passion is really in, in how to make cow-calf producers more profitable. And, and certainly genetics plays a, a really big role in that. And uh, Dr. Rolf talked about sort of the practical applications of genomic testing in beef production. And, and part of her talk was really focused on uh, the seed stock side, so doing a better job of enhancing the knowledge we have and accuracy of uh, genomic predictors on the uh, seed stock 
stuck in. Um, the other part was, well, how do we sort of translate some of those tools into uh, into commercial settings? And some of them do a great job uh, working across both sort of sectors of the beef business. So uh, paternity identification, so using DNA markers to resolve the pedigree uh, of, of animals is, is a really effective tool um, and one we can use very strategically in, in commercial production to um, maybe if we've had some calving difficulty, um, we can genotype those affected calves um, back to figure out which sire they're out of. And uh, I, I call that the assignment of blame, you know, approach. And, and that's really important that we figure out, um, you know, those ones that are disrupting the production cycle because of their contribution to the gene pool. In, in some other cases, uh, some of the sort of trait specific development tools um, in the commercial sector in the absence of other knowledge can be really helpful. Um, but if we've got good pedigree information and, and other data, sometimes the utility gets a little fuzzier about how we might uh, apply that with a reasonable expectation of a return on that investment. But for the most part, and as the name implies, the Applied Repro Strategies and Beef Cattle Workshop was offering up information that can be taken to the countryside and put to work. That's right. And I think the um, one of the, the really important uh, messages here to that end was a discussion, and, and I gave a talk on this in specific, but uh, there was uh, references by no less than probably a dozen of the presenters about the importance of sort of the phenotypic attributes of replacement heifers. And, and by that, I mean, we know from the experimental data that heifers born in the first part of a calving distribution and then themselves that breed early in the breeding season as yearlings have a much better likelihood of success long-term in the production system. And I think sometimes we get, in, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, kind of wrapped up in the whole genetics argument when, in fact, Reproductive traits have low heritabilities, and so we need to focus on opportunities to exploit management in the environment we create for those heifers um, and make sure we pick the ones that have the best likelihood of success. And for uh, most of us, that means picking heifers born early in the calving distribution as replacements, potentially um, maybe modest development of those females, challenging them at breeding time in a restricted um, bull exposure or artificial insemination program, and then picking the heifers that conceive to that. And they represent, uh, in all likelihood, the most fertile, um, heifers and the ones that long term are probably out of the cows that are most environmentally adapted to our production system. Well, Bob, producers will have an opportunity in the coming days and weeks to see in agricultural media and otherwise what was passed along at this workshop in greater detail than what we can get into today. But suffice it to say, this effort was very well worth the time and the trouble, uh, and it was a tremendous resource and exchange amongst producers as well as researchers. That's right, Eric. And uh, as, as sort of a follow-on for those of you that uh, either attended and want to go back and kind of recap some uh, materials. I know I've got a couple of talks I'm going to go back and listen to again. These uh, proceedings from uh, the Applied Repro Strategies and Beef Cattle Meeting here in Manhattan um, will be archived on uh, the ASRBC website as well as linked off our ksubeef.org website. Um, and so we'll have uh, recordings of the presentations, uh, slide sets, a formal proceedings document, um, as well as a series of uh, sort of short summary videos from each of the presenters here in Manhattan. Excellent. Check that out. The link is at ksubeef.org. Bob, hats off to you, to Sandy Johnson, to all the others with uh, K-State ties that contributed to pulling this off. It was a big effort and a successful one. Great. Thanks, Eric. He's Bob Weber, Cow-Calf Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. He, in fact, was one of the presenters at this 2017 Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle Workshop hosted by K-State Research and Extension earlier this week here in Manhattan. After this break, we'll return on Agriculture Today with the agricultural news headlines of the day. This week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update, Greg Akagi, standing by with that as always. And once more, this week's K-State Horticulture segment is still ahead. So please stay with us, won't you? Here on the K-State Radio Network. today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. 
Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Over now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, the hurricane and the subsequent flooding in Texas this week has prompted the state of Kansas to take action to assist and expedite disaster recovery efforts. Yesterday, Governor Sam Brownback signed an executive order to lift regulations on motor carriers traveling from and through Kansas en route to aid in recovery from the widespread damage left by Hurricane Harvey. This will only apply to motor carriers and persons operating commercial motor vehicles who are directly participating in relief and restoration efforts in Texas. It will temporarily suspend licensing, certification, and permitting rules and regulations, registration and fuel tax permits, and will waive fees for overdimension and overweight permits. In addition, height and weight limits for participating motor carriers have been extended to 12 feet in width and 14 feet 6 inches in height. This action will help those who wish to provide hay and other supplies to help farmers and ranchers in Texas during the recovery, as well as others who are traveling through the state for those relief efforts. Now, the Kansas Department of Agriculture has created a page on the KDA website for Hurricane Harvey Disaster Recovery Resources. You can find that at www.agriculture.ks.gov slash hurricane recovery, all one word, agriculture.ks.gov slash hurricane recovery. Scarlett Higgins has more now about the relief efforts and how folks can help. News about the well-being of ranchers and livestock in the area affected by Hurricane Harvey has been limited since the storm hit Texas. According to David Anderson with Texas A&M University, there are 1.2 million head of cattle possibly impacted in the 54-county disaster area. The Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association is working with state and local response agencies to coordinate relief and support efforts for livestock producers. Special rangers with the cattle raisers are in the impacted area assessing damage and assisting producers. The organization is helping direct those with animals that need relocated to resources with holding facilities. TSCRA is fielding reports of missing and found livestock and trying to match up animals with their owners. Another way the Cattle Raisers is working to help producers is by encouraging donations to the Texas Department of Agriculture STAR Fund. This fund provides emergency assistance to Texas farmers and ranchers affected by natural disasters. Funded exclusively through private donations, STAR funds often are used to rebuild fences, restore operations, and pay for other agricultural disaster relief. Anyone interested in donating to the State of Texas Agriculture Relief Fund can find a link on the Kansas Livestock Association website, KLA.org. I'm Scarlett Hagens. In other headlines today, the Kansas Department of Agriculture's Division of Animal Health has received confirmation from the National Veterinary Services Laboratory that two more horses were confirmed positive for equine infectious anemia, or EIA, one of those located in Finney County, the other horse in Kearney County. Both premises are now under quarantine. All other horses on those sites are being tested. Earlier this month, six horses in Finney County tested positive for EIA, and since that time, the division has conducted detailed surveillance, identifying and testing additional animals connected to that index case. Through that investigation, these two additional horses have been confirmed positive. Surveillance testing continues in that area. The division has established an EIA page on the KDA website, by the way, agriculture.ks.gov slash EIA, where any future positives resulting from this investigation will be posted 
posted. EIA is an incurable infectious disease caused by a virus that can affect horses and other equine species. The virus destroys red blood cells spread through blood-to-blood contact, not through close proximity or casual contact. All infected horses, including those Uh, which are asymptomatic, are carriers of the disease. Horse owners who have concerns about their animal's health or questions about possible exposure should contact their local veterinarian. You're listening to Agriculture Today. On we go now to this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. And standing by with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? Jenna Ernstein from Hayes will be a senior at Kansas State University, and she served as one of the interns at the Kansas Soybean Commission. And I know it's been a busy summer for you, Jenna, there at the Kansas Soybean Commission. It has. What are some of the things you've been doing? We've been able to dip our toes into a lot of the different aspects of the soybean industry, from meeting with farmers to doing hill visits in D.C. and learning a little bit about Kansas agriculture and Kansas economic impact of agriculture. And... The soybean industry plays a vital part in the economic impact here in Kansas. It absolutely does. You have been working a lot with the social media aspect as well, and in many cases trying to draw more people in to have interest in the soybean industry. I have. They kind of let me take over their Instagram account for the summer and help with that. So I've had fun utilizing the Instagram stories feature and helping our followers understand what Kansas Soybean does, um, especially when we're in the field or with our farmers. And I've also had the opportunity to work on the Kansas Farm Food Connection website. What's that about? Kansas Farm Food Connection website is a great way for the different commodity groups in Kansas to come together to promote Kansas agriculture and putting food on the table and helping farmers get their message out. How vital of a tool is it for soybean producers that can use social media, that has social media, to portray what they are doing within the industry and and talk about their everyday life? I think it is so incredibly important. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about agriculture and about the soybean industry that farmers can really help bridge that gap between them and their consumers. What's in the future for you? I'm looking forward to graduating in May, and I've uh, taken the LSAT, so maybe law school is in my future, but I think I'd like to work a little bit in the industry and see what I really want to invest my time into. Did this give you a pretty good taste serving as an intern at this Kansas Soybean Commission? It has. I've loved the opportunity to work with both farmers, producers, B and DC see and just see all aspects of the industry and what I can contribute to it later. Especially your parents both grew up on farms, but you grew up in the city of Hayes. They did, yes. My mom is from DeMar, Kansas, and my dad's from Ellenwood, Kansas. They both grew up on farms, and I grew up in town, and both their families still farms. I saw a little bit, and I kind of dipped my toes in, but I didn't necessarily have the full farm experience. Jenna, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jenna Ernsting from Hayes will be a senior at Kansas State University, served as one of the interns at the Kansas Soybean Commission. She joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. And Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. We'll return after you hear this. This is Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Up for you now on this Agriculture Today, our weekly K-State horticulture segment for you. And we're overdue, frankly, for a quick roundup of insect activity in lawn and garden. Tracking that, as always, is our guest now, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension, Raymond Cloyd. A couple of our landscape ornamental trees, our hardwood trees, walnuts and hickory, are susceptible to another rush of fall webworms around now. Raymond? Yeah, we are seeing fall webworm. Uh, this is the second generation, and which means we're really not too concerned because as we start getting into fall winter, the plants are going to be uh, allocating their nutrients down in the roots for storage. So uh, we still recommend, uh, if it's a visible, prune it out, throw it away, get rid of it. But really, uh, there are 
especially these large hickories and walnuts, you're, you're really not going to get any substantial damage due to that. I mean, there's some aesthetics issue involved, which you can, if you can, simply prune it out, put them in a bag and put them in a garbage can. If you put them in a compost pile, make sure your compost pile is active. It's in the 160 degrees Fahrenheit. If it isn't, then they'll just they'll crawl off and go back to a tree if they can. And they'll feed on the foliage here? In the they feed in the summer. foliage, yeah. Uh, and they stay in their bag. I mean, this is different from eastern tin caterpillar, which comes out. They stay in their bag and, and or, or the nest, and it keeps moving with them. So it's really more difficult to get at them with insecticides unless you break the nest open. That allows birds in there. But I think the best means, Eric, is still just pruning it out or just living with it. One can stick and twirl these around and uh, pull them out that way, the nest itself? Yeah. By, by breaking the nest, it'll allow easy access to birds, which are hungry right yeah. now, uh, to go after those caterpillars. All right. But once again, don't make a big deal about fall webworms on these trees, for they're not going to inflict major lasting damage on those walnuts nor those hickory. Spider mites, and we've had warm enough conditions of late that they can still be found on vegetables like tomatoes, some ornamentals, and the like. You yeah, I mean, we, if, the, if, the, if the temperatures start cooling off, we, we, we will see a reduction in two-spotted spider mite, which is our warm, hot season mite. But they're still out there in great uh, force, tomatoes. We've been ca- getting calls about neem oil. Uh, in most oils, whether they be petroleum, mineral, or neem-based, will kill them by suffocation. We also recommend forceful water sprays as dislodging them from the plants as opposed to using miticides. So a lot of these miticides uh, will impact natural enemies and such, and you can cause flare-ups, especially with seven. Never spray carbaryl or seven uh, for spider mites because you will stimulate spider mite outbreaks. Hmm. So I think uh, at this point is to, you know, forceful water spray, maybe some oils, are, are, will be fairly effective in dealing with spider mites this time of year. If one just lets it ride, so to speak, will they inflict major damage at this point of the season? Well, on tomatoes, they can. I mean, they, they could reduce yields. Of course, tomatoes are, are fruiting right now. But it really, that's a judgment call. It's a good question, Eric. Okay. You know, if if you've got webbing all over your tomatoes, it's probably, you know, it's too late. You, mean, you might as well just pull the plant out and save what's there because it's really a, it's a fruitless task when the spider mites <laughs> are that, that population level. Yeah, but keep an eye out for those and uh, their activity and act accordingly there. Lace bugs on ornamentals, and uh, these are commonplace on certain plants, you say? Oh, absolutely. We're seeing them all over. Uh, hackberry, i got a beautiful crop of my own in my backyard. Of course, I rear insects. Uh, but sycamore, uh, azalea, uh, flowering quince, cotoneaster. There's a whole series of even some annual uh, bedding plants and, and perennials out there are very susceptible. They don't really cause substantial damage. The numbers are, are, are a bit frightening and such. But on large trees and shrubs, they can cause some substantial yellowing. And when you look at the leaf, the top, you'll get kind of a silvery appearance. It does look like leaf hopper spider mite damage. But when you turn the leaf over, you'll see the black nymphs and the, uh, the adults, which are lace-like, is where they get their common name. But again, you know, forceful water sprays, oils and soaps, uh, horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps will do the job. Or really, just do nothing because green lace wings, which is a predator will feed on on the nymphs of the lace bugs. Okay. So natural predators will be as advantageous as anything here, it sounds. Yeah, I think they're just part of the ecosystem, yeah. yeah. And our last bug of interest this time around, squash bugs on our cucurbit crops. We're still very much in the production season for cucumbers and other crops of the like. So Dealing with those might be worthwhile, you say. Well, it is, and, and they're a struggle. When I, when I do the training and talks, it's always the big question, how do you deal with squash bugs? Well, the eggs are laid on the leaf underside, so squishing them or spraying with an oil will help. The nymphs are very susceptible to most insecticides. The problem is when they get to become adults. The adults have a waxy coating on their cuticle or skin that doesn't allow the insecticide to stick unless you put some type of spider sticker or surfactant in there. So it's still it's still a battle. Uh, but the eggs, if you see eggs, squish them or whatever. And the nymphs, you can use an oil or soap to kill them. But it's worth one's time to go ahead and act in some fashion because we still have some production season left. Right. Uh, pumpkins and, and other cucurbits, I've seen heavy populations of squash bugs, both nymphs and adults, and they can cause some substantial damage, especially if you're not doing much and you have a history of, uh, of the squash bugs in the area, it's probably worth your time to do something.
Well, we're winding down the summer gradually here, but it's obvious we've plenty of insect activity yet to contend with in lawn, in garden, and we part by reminding folks once again of the extensive extension resources out from K-State that folks can lean on to deal with these issues. Absolutely. Our newsletter is still out there. Whenever we have an article or a hot thing come up, we'll write about it. We have uh, fact sheets. We have people there that have extension appointments that are always willing to uh, to help you. When we have an insect diagnostician, you can get on the website and, and send uh, that individual uh, samples, and they're usually turnaround times very fast for identification. Yeah. All of that can be accessed and read up about at entomology.ksu.edu, entomology.ksu.edu. As always, we appreciate the recap of what's going on, and we'll talk again soon, Raymond. Thank you. I really look forward to it, Eric. We will have you back. For we've still warm weather yet to go, and that means still more insect activity to consider for you homeowners in your lawn and garden. Raymond Cloyd is a horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, and on this week's K-State Horticulture segment. That's our time for today. On tomorrow's broadcast, we'll welcome back in for his weekly segment on the grain market trends, K-State's Dan O'Brien. Also on board will be K-State's Jeff Whitworth. There's a slew of insect activity in Kansas soybean stands right now. Jeff will offer up advice on contending with those infestations, plus more right here tomorrow. Please be back with us then, won't you? Meantime, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.